I have the wonderful honor today to have a discussion, a purposeful dialogue with a wonderful author, and I hope most of you already know who he is, author John P. Strzelecki. Um, I've read a lot of his books, and uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about him before we jump into this purposeful discussion and exchange, this dialogue. Um, also, uh, John, just so you know, if you have any questions uh, during our discussion, please feel free to ask me if you need to have a drink. Uh, I want you to feel relaxed and at home. I already feel like we're connected and, and good friends uh, and have a lot in common and uh, many similarities. So you are on the bestsellers list. In Germany, things have really exploded. Millions of books, and I've heard something like 23 seconds, every 23 seconds in the German region, speaking Dach regions, there's a book of yours sold. You were 700 weeks on the bestseller list, 200 weeks in the number one spot. Uh, you've sold you know, 4 million copies of, of the Y Cafe. Um, it's been translated uh, in something like 40 different languages. It's on every continent. So, I mean, the list, I could just go on and on of, of your success, and I congratulate you for that success. I know why. I can definitely tell why uh, that is. Um, you ha have a uh, management degree from the uh, Kellogg's Graduate School of Management, and uh, you are a management consultant for a few years and, and have many wonderful things. Here in Germany, you were on a stage uh, right after Obama. The world, um, uh, exactly what it is, is called the World Leadership Summit. Uh, yeah. Last year, 2019, 15,000 people on stage. I mean, unbelievable. You see this big auditorium and, and that. So, uh, wow, that's an honor. And the Germans absolutely love you, but uh, you are uh, a, a hard act to follow because you have a great message and you inspire people. So I'm very honored to have you here and I'd like to welcome you to our little discussion and, and I'm so honored to, to be able to partake in this. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad we have a chance to sit down and talk. I look forward to when we can do this actually sitting next to each other. Um, but in the interim, this is a good, uh, a good substitute. So thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much. Uh, did I leave anything out in, in my introduction of you that you would <laughs> like to add that you feel that's important for people to know um, about you or, or, or what? You know, you, you hit a ton of the highlights as it relates to the books, and I certainly uh, i am grateful for that. I'm humbled always and honored at the way in which the books have been received. I would say the, the other thing, just to sort of put things in perspective about who I am, is I'm also a guy who has backpacked twice around the world. And uh, when I'm doing the things that I love to do, there's a, a variety of them. But one of the most important things to me is throwing on a backpack and heading off to a place that I don't know in a region of the world that I'm just intrigued to learn more about, to meet people who exist in a culture that I'm fascinated by. And then I immerse myself in that experience, trying to be as absolutely local as possible um, when I backpack around the world. My buddy and I always laugh if we're paying more than $30 a night for a hotel room, it's too much. <laughs> and so just as, as much as I love all these aspects that you've talked about, I think it's important for context to people understand that like, there's this whole other side of me as well. And really, it was my first experience of taking a year backpacking around the world that is what inspired me to write the first book. And so that always will uh, hold a very deep place in my heart, this idea of just getting out there and seeing the world and all that that brings to our lives. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing. I, yeah. uh, I know you're an adventurous. You are very big in sports and um, like the outdoors and like traveling. You've uh, been around the world numerous times and, and done fabulous things. Um, there's something with Africa though, right? Is, is there a particular romance or, or um, yeah. <clears throat> something with Africa that you would like to maybe let us know what it is or what we're missing out on for those of us who haven't been there? So, I, I mean, I had dreamed of seeing Africa and experiencing Africa since I was a very little boy. Um, I had read every one of the Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan series books, which is a huge series of books. And 
I, I don't know what it was when I was a child that captured my interest. I love animals. And so I, I suppose there's an element of the opportunity to actually see an elephant in the wild or a lion in the wild was something that I just couldn't even quite wrap my head around as a child, but I thought that would be amazing. Right. And uh, so, yeah, as, as part of the first adventure backpacking around the world, uh, my, my wife and I uh, backpacked through, through South Africa and spent three months just really getting to know the country and the culture and the people and seeing the animals and the experiences. And it was absolutely life-changing. Um, I've since learned some really cool stuff, which is maybe why we have this pull to go to Africa. Uh, I know that so many of the discoveries in terms of ancient hominids were tied to Africa. And so I always had the perception like, oh, well, maybe that was sort of the birthplace of the human experience, right? Six, seven million years ago. But there's something actually much more recent, which is about 70,000 years ago, there was a major volcanic explosion in the South Pacific. And they feel that the human race went down to somewhere around 5,000 people, somewhere between two and 5,000 people. And that the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest, the strongest of the strongest, the most empathic of the most empathic, all migrated to try and find a safe zone. And they feel that the safe zone ended up being somewhere in, in Africa. And so really from that perspective, we all, if it's true, and DNA evidence suggests that it is true, if it's true, then we actually have ties to Africa that are much more recent than the 7 million years that the human race actually re-expanded back out about 70,000 years ago from, from Africa. Because it's really strange when you go there, you have this, at least for me, and I know many other people talk about this too, there's this, this feeling that you're home, which feels odd when you're in a place that you've never been to before, but maybe it is because we do have this deep, deep connection that's not that ancient uh, going back to Africa. So, and I have to say that the, if you are a lover of animals and a lover of cool cultures and, and nature and wildlife, Africa is just a place like no other. I would say Africa and Alaska are like so high on my list of just amazing nature experiences. That's fabulous. I'm so glad to hear that. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. You, you uh, probably know as well that I speak a lot about the hominids and, and the hominids of our, of our close, not too distant past. And uh, yeah. as a matter of fact, in, in November of uh, 2018, they discovered a new uh, hominid in, in the Philippines, in a cave in the Philippines. And, and so there were seven close relatives to us, you know, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, Homo africans, and, and now there's one uh, that they discovered 2018 November uh, out of the Philippines. And, uh, but where are they? They're, they're, they're our closest friends and relatives or, you know, uh, cousins, so to say. And uh, we're on the same branch of the tree as them. And where are they? Where did they go? And yeah. so I like that connection, not only to understand that uh, <clears throat> we're not the only Homo sapiens or the Homo uh, tribe hominids that uh, were, are on this planet or were on this planet, but that they just discovered more. And there's probably others that we don't know of. And that there's some deep ties to Africa that we just don't know about. I, I really love Africa as well. I do a lot of different projects there. I mean, you can see some. And so I, I, I felt that connection, the similarity with you that you're not only a world traveler and an adventurer and that life's a safari and an adventure that uh, I really am, I'm so glad that we can talk about some of these um, moments aha moments but also moments in your life that have kind of maybe influenced you or had given you the opportunity to see the world differently um one of, the, one of the things i love about that mark is and I, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on this as well i think one of the great things about traveling is it just opens your mind in so many different ways and one of the very first things i remember happening so when i was about 28 years old i was graduating from grad school and I had a new job lined up that was going to start about four months later. And so I took the summer off. And prior to that, I literally had been working every single second of my life. I was trying to make it as a professional athlete. I was doing my MBA at night. I was working full time. So my life was just, everything was scheduled for years prior to that. And uh, so I took two trips. One was to Italy and uh, one was to Costa Rica where I spent a month. And I remember going to Italy and it was the first time I'd ever traveled to Europe. 
And uh, the two friends that I was traveling with had some friends in Milan who let us stay with them. And so I got into a shower in Italy. And, you know, in the States, you get into the shower and it's just, it's a massive experience. It's a giant tub and, and you know, yeah. but I get to Italy and I get in the shower. I can't even turn around. Like this thing is so freaking tiny, right? And, I, and there's this, this device at the top of the shower head that I have to turn on to get hot water. And I, I know for people who are, you know, very, very worldly and traveled, et cetera, that this sounds probably foolish, but that was such an aha experience for me that, oh my gosh, not everybody walks into the shower and can, you know, extend their arms as far as they can extend them. And wow, you have to like get into a shower in a, a very modern country, a very advanced society, and you have to turn on the little electric clicker and you have to wait until it warms up. So I think one of the great things about travel is learning that the way you do it is not necessarily the way that everybody else does it. And it is, applies to everything, the way you think about money, the way you think about generosity, the way you think about caring for your fellow human being. As you travel the world, you realize that there are all kinds of different perspectives and ways of doing things. Some are better than what you've learned your whole life. Some are worse. And so I love travel because it opens up the possibility of expanding my mind. And in that mind expansion, I have the chance to grow and say, well, wait, why do I do these things the way that I do them? Because clearly these people don't and it's working out just fine for them. And I, I think that's one of my great wishes. If, if, I, if someone asked me, you know, what would you highly recommend to someone who's 17, 18, I would say take a year and go backpack around the world because you're going to come back and you're going to look at your life completely differently and probably every bit is equally important. You're going to look at the rest of the world differently. And it's very hard to have an us versus them perspective in life when you've actually spent time with the them. And, and that applies whether it's people of a different ethnicity, people of a different culture, people of a different geography. Because um, what you, the other thing you realize when you travel so much around the world, as I'm sure you know, just, you know, parents care about raising their kids and, and giving them love and, and giving them opportunities. No matter where you go around the world, you see these commonalities that are so much bigger than the small differences that sort of become these reasons for why we should dislike each other. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That's uh, very interesting. And it brings up two questions that I have. One, do you feel like you're a global citizen? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, what do you understand by being a global citizen? If you have that feeling and then two, we're really, even though we have these cultural differences and this, this kind of places we live and languages we speak, if you take the even more cosmic perspective or the earth view perspective, we're all on the same boat, the same planet, you know? Yeah. And I'd like to, uh, I mean, that's kind of what you're touching upon as, as well, not only with the comment about the hominids, but also seeing how other brothers and sisters, relatives, cousins of ours are living around the world, but we're all humans. We're all global citizens. Yeah. What do you have yeah. to say to that? Well, that, one of the tremendous things that has uh, transitioned for me in terms of having the opportunity to travel, choosing to go travel is exactly what you're talking about. The perspective that just because I was born in one spot geographically. So, you know, you drop out of your mother's womb and there you are and, and you get rights and privileges and um, benefits or non-benefits depending on where you drop out. And so I happened to be born in the United States and with that came basically a golden ticket passport that said the, the vast majority of the rest of the world will let you in to experience their culture, their people, simply because you were born on that spot on the planet. And oh, by the way, the economic system that you happen to be born into, John, also is quite strong. And so you, if you work hard, will have the opportunity to accrue a certain amount of financial wealth if you, will, if you work hard and you, know, you do the appropriate things. But you know what? The other thing I realized as I traveled around the world is there are people who work just as hard but they dropped into an economic zone where they're not going to get nearly the payoff. And it's not because they're not diligent. It's not because they don't work hard. It's not because they're not smart. And so this uh, really left me with some interesting internal dialogues. One was a little bit of, I suppose it's in the same category of like survivor's guilt 
where I asked myself, well, why did I get this? You know, I remember being in Cambodia. I was there with my wife and my, my little daughter. My daughter was four and a half. We took her for a year when she was four and a half to go backpack around the world because I wanted her to really see what the world was and to understand that she was part of something bigger. And I remember walking into one of the temples in Angkor Wat and there was this little kid, you know, eight years old, and she's cutting up pineapples at like lightning pace. And, you know, would you pineapple, pineapple, and she's selling. She's eight years old, you know, with a, with a, a machete blade, you know, that's super sharp. And, and I thought, my God, like this kid would be CEO of Ford Motor Company or IBM or Facebook, right? If she had the same opportunities. And uh, so I, I, I feel a tremendous responsibility to, to live my life as authentically as possible to do everything that I can possibly do to live an extraordinary life as I define it for myself because I've been given this gift. And I think what a travesty it would be if I was given this gift and didn't use it. So that's part of it. But I also feel equally important is that this, this gift that I have comes with a responsibility because just because I got the gift, I didn't do anything special to get the gift. I, I literally just dropped out of the womb. I didn't, contribute anything. I didn't add any value at that point, nothing. And so I feel a tremendous responsibility as a citizen of the world to make sure that that kid in Cambodia has the same chance. And, uh, you know, the, the, the child in Africa who's born into a township and whose parents have died of AIDS and now is being raised by a community center in many cases, that they have the same chance because I didn't do anything to get this. And I think that's horribly unfair if I don't, at least on some level, acknowledge that and do my part to help create that same opportunity for somebody else. Um, yeah. and, and so, yeah, I, I, I realize, and, and the other thing is I'm a big fan of history. And the more I study history, the more you realize like the borders are completely made up. Yeah. I mean, 300 years ago in the United States, <laughs> I, I mean, the native Americans actually owned it. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can go to Europe and redraw the borders certainly less than 300 years ago, the Middle East less than. So, yeah, I think much bigger reality is that we're just all hominids walking the planet and the little lines, the imaginary lines, like those are made up. So we're really part of something bigger. And I love what you said about being on the planet, because one of my favorite things to do is when I'm in the midst of my own personal pity parties or thinking my issues are so critical. I go out at night and I just look up and I did the math one time because I'm a little geeky in that regard. And so what you can see on a very crystal clear night, like if you're in the, in a place where there's complete uh, darkness and you can really see the stars like Namibia at night is just some of the most spectacular star viewing I've ever seen. And on a night like that, when it looks like there are just millions of stars up there that what the naked eye can actually perceive is about 3000 stars. And to put that in perspective, if I remember the math right, that's like 0.00000005% of what is actually in our galaxy. And there's 150 more billion galaxies beyond. I mean, that is just like, I mean, how do you even begin to comprehend that mentally? And so, yeah, I think to myself, wow, we're on this one little planet. Like maybe we could like team up together and do a better job. Exactly. That's so fabulous. <laughs> you know, that's uh, Carl Sagan's play, pale blue dot. That's uh, um, we're, we're the, one of the only mammals that sleeps on his back to gaze up into the stars, to gaze out somewhere else um, because we feel secure enough to do that. There's a lot to that um, knowing of our smallness. And yeah. also our connectedness to this planet. I, I say the, the evolution that we're on is this homo symbiosis that we're part of a symbiotic earth that we really realize how, what an integral part of this earth that we play and we need to be uh, caring about people in Cambodia and Africa and everywhere around the world because they're part of our family. And if they do well and, uh, because of where they were dropped out of the womb at, because something that they didn't choose to, to be born in a certain culture or religion, a language place on this earth with different uh, um, rights or abilities because of where they were born, that we can 
kind of level the, the playing field, make it equality for all and make sure that everybody's getting what they need. And that's what, I mean, you really have a strong message in all of your books that um, uh, I kind of, I, I relate it to. And that's why I mentioned the similarities uh, uh, that we have is I, I think we both started working when we were very young age and, yeah. and uh, weren't really born into a lot of wealth and, and, and success and, and that we, you know, uh, which I live in Germany, which is, uh, is very unheard of that in Germany you would be working at, you know, 10, 11, 12 years of age or doing things um, because of the situation you were born in or the type of family you grew up in, uh, uh, which also gives you a different perspective, even though you weren't born in in India or Africa or somewhere where, you know, that. Yeah. So, uh, I, I really... I like how you know you you also touched upon big history, how important it is to know the big history because it gives us that cosmic perspective of where our place is and how we integrate with those uh, uh, other fellow human beings and, and that and so that uh, really transitions me over to this this next point is, is are those similarities or the the early beginning of how that start, was there a moment where you would say you were struck by lightning or it changed your life or was it a gradual thing over time that occurred or uh, this, the, the lights went up or things became clearer for you that led to this? Yeah, so there was, there are definitely a combination of those two. So there's been numerous defining aha moments. One of the most profound was uh, when I was, as I said, when I was 28, I was, I was in this, this unbelievable rat race of every minute being scheduled. If I wasn't training, I was studying. If I wasn't studying, I was working. If I wasn't uh, training, I was in a t competition. You know, So uh, there was a plan for everything, and everything was on a specific schedule. And then I went down to Costa Rica, and this is you know, 20 some, more than 20 years ago. Uh, gosh, I'm, I'm getting older. Yeah, 20 some years ago. Uh, and this was the first time I'd ever been down to Central America. And when you're in Costa Rica, it's a totally different pace. And people would look at that time, especially people looked at that type of pace and were like, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing it? And not in a judgmental way, but really out of a state of, huh, like, that's different. And uh, so here I was backpacking through Costa Rica with a buddy of mine. And uh, the infrastructure was horrible at that time. The roads were just abysmal. Oh my God, to get from point A to point B, the, the potholes, and uh, so after three weeks on the road or so with him, I was sitting on a beach, this beautiful, beautiful beach. We had spent the day body surfing. You could rent a boogie board or a surfboard for like five bucks for the day. And uh, we'd eaten pancakes. There was this little three-walled building, no roof, that this woman was making pancakes. A giant pancake for a dollar. And uh, it had just been a day of spectacular nirvana, just hanging out with my buddy, surfing all day. And we were sitting there watching the sunset. And I remember sitting on the, literally sitting on this log and watching as the sky changed and there was a spectacular sunset. And, and those, this particular spot we were at just has these big, nice waves. It's just, it's just very relaxing and calming. And, and I remember thinking to myself in that moment, like this has probably been going on for millions, if not billions of years. And this is going to go on for another millions, if not billions of years after I am gone. And so if all the things I thought were so important, and it's not going to matter whether I do my stuff or not do my stuff, this is still going to be going on. These waves are going to be crashing on this beach. And so what that brought to my mind was if all the things I thought were so critically important aren't, then what actually is important? And this inspired me to ask the question, which has been the profound question that I talk about in the first book I wrote called The Cafe on the Edge of the World. And the question is, why am I here? And I suppose if you've been on that path for a long time, you hear someone say that and you're like, well, of course someone should ask themselves that question, but it had never dawned on me, Mark. <laughs> I just thought you just, I don't know, you just do stuff. You, you work hard. You, I, I don't know. It never dawned on me to ask the question, why am I here? Why, why did I get this gift of life? Why statistically am I going to get 28,900 days on the planet? 
And therefore, what do I want to do with my time while I'm here? This awareness that I can actually be the master of my own destiny. And so this was an incredibly defining moment for me to ask that question, why am I here? And uh, I would love to say that from that moment on, everything changed. I totally had this sense of self-awareness, but quite the contrary. I remember coming back to the airport after my experience, writing in my journal, never forget that this exists, this whole other world. And then I promptly leapt back into corporate America and forgot for five more years. But I finally had a revelation and went back out and saw the world. And that's when it all sort of reclicked and connected. And that's what led to the books. So that, that brings up the perfect point to, to uh, a question. So we get this aha moment. We finally ask ourselves the question. We kind of start to put things into perspective. And then we go right back. <laughs> life we had before, right? It's like, right. oh, grow, and you cry. Maybe it's a deep emotional moment uh, or even weeks. But then you go right back to what you were doing before and it almost you almost forget it. Yeah. So uh, the situation we're in now, and you've touched upon a couple things that could be related to that. And, and I, I don't like to to really discuss it too much except for the positives. You and I, and many of the other leaders uh, that we know, uh, we've been living and working and uh, functioning in the future for a long time because we've asked the why, we've discovered and we didn't go back. You, Even though you did go back, we eventually made the curve and didn't go back and are on a different path. Yeah. And so we're now we're prepared. So that brings me to why are you here? How did you get here? How, how, how is this time now for you? Are you still working and functioning? And uh, what do you um, want to have to say about that? But a question I always ask is WTF, what's the future? Yeah, yeah. The burning well, so question. I think, I think one of the wonderful things that has come out of, so, so first of all, yeah, my life really hasn't changed that much in terms of what's going on because I've been um, a nomadic traveler for quite a while now, I'd say for it, about 20 years. And, uh, you know, one of the great joys of, of doing my backpacking trips when I was younger, I say that I'm always so grateful for that, was that I learned that I could exist with nothing more than what could fit in my pack. And the rest of it had to be up here in my enjoyment of the day. But in terms of physical possessions, the only thing I had was what could fit in my backpack. And uh, really, that's about five days worth of clothing, a pair of hiking boots, and some accessories. It's really not that much. And one of the wonderful takeaways from that was that I really didn't need much to be happy. Quite the contrary. What I needed to be happy was to be out there doing the things that made me feel fulfilled. And that answer is going to be different for, for everybody. Um, for some people, it might be literally working in the bakery that they, didn't, they came up with and they invented and they loved. For somebody else, it might be being in a classroom as a teacher. Everybody's answer is different. Um, but for me at the time, it was out there seeing the world, interacting with people, learning about different cultures, learning languages, all of that stuff was what made me feel fulfilled. And I didn't need a bunch of physical stuff to make that happen. As a matter of fact, to the contrary, that was the happiest I had ever been in my life and I had the least possessions. And so I'm so happy that I, I had that experience when I was younger in, my, in the late 20s, early 30s because it could have been the rest of my life I didn't understand that and I then didn't have the opportunity to reap the rewards. So that's one of the other things that I often recommend to younger people is to as soon as possible go get these experiences because it's gonna shape you. And once you learn something, you have it for the rest of your life. And so, you know, get out there and have these experiences. So I think one of the benefits of what's going on now is sort of the situation has demanded that we all learn something. And whether people were ready for it or not, uh, whether they were interested or not, by default, everybody's working from home and having to figure out what it's like to be a little bit more nomadic, to live with less. So you can't really go out shopping at the store right now. And what does that mean to you? How does it make you feel? Are you comfortable with that? So I think this situation, and this is interesting in the context of the, the planet itself, so maybe, maybe there's an essence of the planet being like, going to put a little halt to this massive like overkill consumerism pollution the rest of that we're just going to take a little break everybody everybody spend some time at home have a few learnings and then we'll sort of ease everybody back into the potential realities and see what you learn from the process 
Um, because right now, yeah, a lot of people are being forced into a radically different reality and trying to adjust to it. Now, there's always wonderful things that come out of this. And one of the things that I think can come out of this is maybe everybody doesn't need to be commuting to work every day. So maybe we can reduce our fuel fossil consumption and our carbon footprints because as much as people fought the idea that their employees could work at home and be, um, be productive, the reality is that very often people are far more productive in environments where they can control their own reality, control their own pace. Um, if you are a parent and you love your kids, it makes you feel really good to drop your kid at school and then pick your kid up from school. And you really can't do that if you're forced to be at your job at 8 a.m. and then stay there until 5 p.m. So maybe one of the great things that'll happen is we'll learn that we can actually blend the work-life balance quite well without losing productivity. And we actually pick up a lot for the planet because we reduce our footprints, we reduce the fossil fuel consumption, we reduce the congestion, we actually have more time in our day. Like I think a lot of good things can come from this. Another one being the school thing, I know that we and I, you and I have talked about this offline. So I have a daughter and as I said, when she was four and a half, we spent a year backpacking around the world. At that point, almost everybody else her, her age was in kindergarten. And uh, so then when she came back, she tried regular kindergarten for a little while, loved that. But then at some point decided she wanted to do homeschooling. So we've done homeschooling, we've done virtual schooling, we've done regular school. And I know that I talked to so many people around the world, Germany in particular, and they're like, gosh, we would love to do that, but that's not the way our system is set up. It's not actually even allowed. Well, now it's allowed because everybody's learning remotely. And so I think there could be this huge awakening that, you know what, for some kids, sitting in a classroom is awesome. Like that is the best way for them to learn. That is the best way for them to have the social connections. But for other kids, and this would totally have been me when I was a kid, they can actually learn far more at a much faster rate by not sitting in the classroom all day. And so that could be a fantastic takeaway from the situation that we're in. And I would say the last one, because you talked about the global community, is this is one of those rare times, Mark, where we're all in this together. This is like that movie, what was that movie with Will Smith where the aliens invaded and saw Independence all, Day, yeah. Independence Day, right, yeah. And so all of a sudden there was something bigger than our own squabbles, which drew the entire world together to see us as a global community. This is it. It didn't require aliens invading. It actually took a microscopic virus that you actually can't even see to make all of us realize that, whoa, we're all in this together. And so I think there is the potential to have really good stuff come out of this because it's no longer about the them, right? Now it's about us. Yeah, the, the alien, uh, for, as comparison to the movie, the alien is the virus, is, is this, yeah. this thing. So, um, you know, we, we kind of, in some respects, it's sad that we need an alien or something else to bring us together, to unify us. I have another friend from Helsinki, Finland, uh, Mika is his name. And he, I said, you know, how can we rally uh, everyone on earth and break down these nations and borders? And he says, we need an alien. You know, we, we need an alien invasion and that, that will unify us. Well, uh, I don't, I don't think we need that. I think we can do it. Our, I believe we can rally and do it ourselves uh, and come together. We're, uh, we're not that different. No matter what color or language we speak, we're really not that different. And in your books, I mean, uh, I know we kind of have touched a little bit on, on some of the stories and things in your books, but in your books, there's a lot of lessons. There's a lot of examples. There's a lot of things that really could be seen as self-help, but they're really all applicable to not only whether you want to live a nomadic life or whether you want to live a corporate life or whether you want to be a, an entrepreneur, um, however you want to lead, live, that if you apply that, you don't have that emotional experience and then go right back to the, the old way business as usual, the old way of living, that you can actually apply those and that they work and they're more efficient and and it doesn't mean you're dumber or poorer or whatever, that you yeah. learn to live more resiliently. And so I think the way we live and the way you're talking about is not about minimalism or getting just scraping by. It's about a, a different form of resilience. And um, that's really what I, 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 I take out of a lot of the lessons in your, your book. And it's a more efficient operating man uh, uh, model for 
not only for your life, but for your business as well, if you're looking at it uh, uh, from the aspect as an entrepreneur or corporate, um, that it's just more efficient, resilient model to function under, that uh, you have that balance you talked about. So I really appreciate you sharing those stories. And I, I said the similarities as we both started working young and, and uh, you're homeschooling your daughter. And, Germany, that's really unheard of. They're like, that's child yeah. labor. You can't be working as a kid and uh, you have to, you know, do a practicum when you're maybe in high school or junior high school age, you can do kind of a practicum. But other than that, that's, a, you know, you don't work until you're ready. You go to school first and, and there's some set guidelines and things. And that's great. But uh, uh, there's people in in Africa, especially, who... Uh, women and girls who don't get an education, they don't get to go to school. They have to go harvest food and be farmers and work and haul water and do yeah. different things. And so that perspective of that you mentioned in the beginning of being in different locations and seeing how people live and um, our, 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 our family, how they live in other parts of the world is really important. Well, and I think what you touched on is, is in a, something you mentioned a few seconds ago is the key. And that is all, all policies start off with good intentions, I find. And, and the thing is that it's very hard to find a one-size-fits-all solution for anything. And so what I talk about in my books is that one of the unique opportunities, challenge certainly, but opportunity more so as a human being is to figure out what is the one size that fits you. And... I think overall we tend to look for, as I said, solutions that apply to everyone, but very, very rarely, I can think of almost nothing in life that works for everyone. Even, you know, medicine on an individual basis, something that works for one person may not work for someone else because of their unique body chemistry or blood type or whatever. And so if you extrapolate that concept out, you can say again, you know, sitting in a classroom might work perfect for one type of child and not being allowed to work until they're 18 might be perfect. And certainly that's better than having five and six year olds working in factories, a hundred percent. At the same time, it's important to realize that, you know, for some kids who are really entrepreneurial, it might be a good thing that when they're 10, 12, 14, that they have the chance to test the waters in that space a little bit, because that might be the thing that really kicks their creativity in motion. That might be the thing that gets them fired up about learning. I remember being in school and one of the things that I always struggled with, and my teachers hated me for this. I always was asking them, so what is the point of this? Like, you know, you're having me learn arc sine, cosine, tangent, the rest of that. How am I going to practically apply this in my life? And I know that there are jobs that, that need that, engineering in particular. Like, you need to understand those things. But it was their inability to explain back to me how what I was learning was going to be applicable to my life that I felt frustrated about. And so I envision a world in which if you could allow a child, and I've worked with a lot of kids over the years, of all kids and adults of all different ages, to help them identify what are, I call that your big five for life. What are the five things you most want to do, see, or experience during your lifetime? And when you can help a child identify those five things, well, now you can help them understand how why this piece of academia is relevant to their life path. Not relevant to the life path that I have told them they need to go take, but relevant to the life path that they have chosen. It's a whole different world at that point. And, and it's the same for us as adults too. Uh, when, when I know the direction that I want to go so that I can live an extraordinary life by my own definition of extraordinary, now I can start to understand my role in the global picture. Now I can start to understand why it's important that I am a contributor, why I don't take the plastic bottle and just pitch it into the ocean. I mean, I love the ocean. I'm constantly by the water when I have a chance. And I see stuff like that and I think, how can someone be that idiotic? Well, that's just my filter, but the truth is that for whatever reason, they don't understand that throwing the bottle in the ocean creates the problem that it does. They don't understand how their life goals, their, their desires, which might include to spend a beautiful day at the beach, is not sync in sync with just pitching the bottle into the ocean. And so I think the more that we have the opportunity to help young people especially identify, this is the life that I want to live. Oh, and here's how all this stuff is relevant. And oh, here's how that makes me part of a global community. That's an opportunity right there. It is. And it's a, probably one of the, the world's biggest opportunities. So and w w we have a lot of global grand challenges. And um, 
when when we have challenges, those are also the biggest opportunities to do yeah. good and make a change. And so, I I um, there's a question I wanted to ask a little bit later, but it's a, it's a relevant point. So, and you brought we brought it up earlier. Um, most people wait until a, 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 a older age or uh, to ask them the question why or uh, yeah. uh, what is the meaning of life and to ask these deep questions. And what I've come across is many haven't asked it at all or they have asked it, they get that aha moment and then they go right back to the regular life. And then over time, there's this like a zombie transformation or a desensitization. We almost become numb to the world. We gain weight, we eat, we watch TV, we do whatever else that kind yeah. of distance us from nature and our world. And then we're on a different path or we get off the path that we possibly could take. Yeah. Uh, with reaching children, so one, I'm a sustainable development goal advocate, you know that, and one of the SDGs, the 17 SDGs is quality education, good health and well-being, zero hunger, uh, uh, no poverty. Quality education to give youth, the uh, uh, young children and youth, the ability to read, but also to discover their own yeah. big five for life, their own purpose for existing is so vital. Uh, honestly, being totally honest, when I finished high school, when I graduated high school, I did very well in college credits and everything. I was ready to go work at McDonald's. I didn't know what my purpose was. I didn't know. I mean, yeah. I traveled the world. I was a global Same citizen, here. but I didn't, I was, I was lost. I didn't get the tools. I didn't get the yeah. knowledge and wisdom um, for, from, from that education. And it, it's, it, it's all, it becomes overwhelming and depressing. And, and um, so yeah. the, your inspi inspirational books, your message, the way you speak, um, People are not only ready now, not only during this time have we kind of got this reset and I'm busier than ever because people are saying, hey, what can we do? What can we do? What can we apply? How can, how can yeah. we do it? How does it make sense to me? Um, and so my, my question for you is, uh, what's the message that you would give them? But I want you to answer it in the form of this question. What does a world that works for everyone look like to you? So I, I reflect back on my experiences with a combination of younger people, as well as people who are in the situation you're talking about where they've worked for many years and now they're just trying to cover up the pain. And so I'll try and hit both of those. So I think for the youth, the opportunity is to help them identify the life that they would love to live. And then it's, this is going to sound simplistic, but I've seen it work. It's simplistic because I think it is simple. I think life is designed actually to be simple. We make it very complex. So from a very simplistic perspective, if you help children identify the five things that they most want to do, see or experience in life, that would make them feel like they are really living an amazing life. And then you match them up with someone who can demonstrate the path to that. So if they want to be a filmmaker, Help them identify, I call them their who's. It's not about how do I do this, it's about who. Who's already done this? And so many times in life we try to, to figure it all out, but in truth, if we were able to just have a one-hour conversation with someone, it would save us literally months, if not years, of trial and error. Not recreating so, the will kind of a thing. Totally, constantly, all mm -hmm. the time. And so, and I use this example in terms of travel. When someone says, I'm interested in backpacking around the world, I say, well, let's sit down for lunch because in an hour I can tell you so many of the things that are going to be tremendously useful. So it's helping kids identify where they want to go in their life, matching up the academic criteria that align with that. Because honestly, if they're going to do something that is um, in the creative arts and the visual arts, they really don't need to know arc, cosine, and tangent. I've never used it since I was a junior in high school. Never, right? And so I think aligning the intellectual inputs with their interests keeps them fired up and excited and interested in learning because the whole goal of learning should be the love of learning. It's the joy of like, that's cool, right? And I think every kid has experienced that. Uh, you learn something ridiculously cool about a platypus and the fact that it's the only mammal that lays eggs except for the acnea. And 
And you see kids get so excited about something because they're interested in it. And so, again, if you can help them identify the path they want to walk, then you align their inputs academically with that. And you help them understand why math is important, why reading is important. So the core subjects and then the external subjects. And then you max them up with great mentors and who's. And we live in an unprecedented era of technology to do that. Uh, if you're interested in being um, a, a world traveler who's passionate about animals, within seconds, Mark, you and I could help connect a kid to a half dozen great eBooks, probably 50 YouTube videos from you know, people throughout the last 100 years where their stories have been told or documented through documentaries or they actually have them live. Everybody from Jane Goodall to the, you know, um, uh, the guy who did all the underwater stuff from France. Um, Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau. His, uh, his story is amazing. His biography is absolutely amazing. We would have nothing that we have in terms of our ability to see the underwater world if it wasn't for Jacques Cousteau and a limitation he had on his physicality. Yeah. So that's a big part of the story, right? Understanding these biographies of these who's to know the hurdles and the challenges. Enabling the kids with that totally sets them up for success. And what I love, I didn't even think about it until you were talking about this earlier. What I love about that is, so imagine you've got a kid who is passionate about learning um, the jellyfish migration patterns, right? And they grew up in an area down by me, so Florida, coastal region. But you can link them up technologically with a kid who lives in Melbourne, Australia, and another one who lives in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and the three of them in seconds, especially now, because we know this because yeah. everybody has to do it with the current situation, they can get on a Zoom call and they can talk about what they're learning, how is it going, the rest of that. Now, all of a sudden, when somebody says, hey, uh, you know, all the people in Africa, they don't know this or they don't know that or all oh, those Australians. That, no, because I know people in those countries and I know what they're like. I know them on a human to human level. So imagine the chance to expand our understanding of what it's like to be a global citizen and to expand our database of knowledge because of these things. And now you've got people who are passionate about what they're doing. So the, the growth rate in knowledge, the growth rate in major breakthroughs is exponential compared to what the example you were giving, which is so true, which is, and I have been there, so trust me, I'm not in any way judging this because I lived so much of my life in this space, but I get in my car, I drive to work, I get to the job, I look at the clock and I think, if I could fast forward that to 5.30, I literally would close my eyes and do it right now. Yeah. And then I go home and I'm burned out because of that job. And so I make my dinner, I sit on the couch, I have a couple of beers to dull the pain, I watch some TV, I go to bed and I do it all again the next day. Yeah. I mean, how much are we learning? How much are we progressing? How many great discoveries come from that as our state? And again, I have been there, I have lived that life. I know how Me depressing too. that feels. And so that was it for the kids. But for the adults, it's a really similar picture. It's about identifying, you know what, no matter what my starting point is, from this moment on, here are the things that I most want to do, see or experience in my lifetime. All right, who's living my ideal life? Who's got my ideal job? And what was the path they took to get there? What academic training did they have? What major obstacles did they overcome? What things did they need to learn? And then I start slowly transitioning my life to more match that life that I want to live. And maybe this isn't dramatically cutting the ties and go backpack around the world, which is what I did in, in, you know, when I was 32, 33. Maybe it's a slower transition for people. But you know what? Hey, if you just transition one minute a day. Right? So if you say to yourself, Mark, you know what? I've always wanted to learn more about um, kite surfing. And, and you challenge me and you say, all right, John, so what I want you to do is I want you to find one minute of the time that you were spending doing something else today. And I want you to spend that one minute on kite surfing. You can watch YouTube videos, you can look at a magazine, whatever. But I, at the end of the day today, John, you say to me, I would like you to be one minute smarter about kite surfing. So, all right, I can find one minute more. The next day you say to me, John, can you find one minute? Really, because now I've already figured out a way to reallocate the previous one minute. At the end of this, at the end of a single year, a single year, six and a half hours of my day has now been realigned in the direction that I want my life to go. That is unbelievable progress. And all it, all it takes, one minute. Yeah, and I, I like how you break that down into not only data, numbers, minutes, hours, years, you know, the 28,900. Uh, there's 
there's that done a lot in your books, but also in, in, in your talks. And I really yeah. think that's so important because it's talking about productivity and, and efficiency, but also for one's life to put into perspective. We hear a lot of data and numbers, but we don't realize how it's uh, those, those steps that compound over time, which is the exponential function. And yeah. after you've taken 30 of those exponential steps it seems pretty linear growth but then the next thing you know you're here and we're seeing it with covid we're seeing yes. it with everything um that that is such a beautiful thing to put those those into perspective on how you can really get there and and what it. what helps with that mark because you're so right this is what you were talking about before is why is it that we can take three steps forward and seem we seem to be making great progress and then the next thing you know we're right back at the starting line and it's like anything in life that we're looking for reinforcements. We're looking for positive reinforcement that things are going well. And also it's because we don't understand the journey. We don't understand the obstacles along the path. But what I've learned over time is that the more of these who's that you have and the more you understand their journey, the more you realize that it is not a straight shot to victory. It's not that I start on day one and on day six, I'm a millionaire. And on day 20, I'm on the cover of Time Magazine. It's a process. And when you know the process, it makes it so much easier to slog through. Uh, it's, it's just like you know that there's steps 1 through 28. And often somewhere in steps 1 through 28 is step 14, which is all, everything goes to hell. You know, that's the, the chaos day. And right. understanding that one of the days will probably be the chaos day, then when it happens, you know how to deal with it. So to me, this totally applies to kids, but it absolutely applies to adults as well, is having an understanding of that process is what enables us to not fall backwards and end up back at the starting line five years ago. Exactly. I mean, there, there's a couple things that, that occur in there. One, doing something over and over and over and over again, hoping for different results totally. is the definition of insanity. So going back to something that we already know didn't work is not yeah. going to be different results. The second thing is, is some days we will wake up or say, I just don't want to get up to go work out or to go on an adventure or to read that book or to do that. I'm yeah. tired. I don't want to drink a beer and watch TV and just veg out. Yeah. The majority of your days as a, as a youth or an adult are steps in the right direction. And you have a couple bad days majority of those will eventually achieve that compound effect and that, that, that place you want to be. Not every day is going to be great. Um, no, I, I talk about that with the ascending life curve. Yeah. The ascending life curve is so important. I love that. So, yeah. And so it's for people that aren't familiar with it, the idea is simply that <clears throat> most people go through life and their curve is pretty similar. So you've got time on the bottom of the graph and you've got satisfaction um, on the left axis on the, the vertical axis. And so most people have highs and they have lows, but the highs are about the same high, the lows are about the same lows, and then as they physically and mentally decline towards the end, the highs get lower and eventually we just die. And this was certainly the way that I was going through my life for, for decades. And what I realized is that there are always going to be highs and lows. That is part of the human experience. So it's never gonna be, again, a straight shot. Every day is perfect, 365 days of the year, 24 by seven, wow, couldn't have been better, Mark. Like that, that's just not realistic. However, what can happen is that the more minutes of our day, of our 24 hours that are in alignment with this life that we want to live, that at some point, although you still have lows, your lows are now higher than what used to be your highs. And the example I often give for this is there, there was a time I was working a job I didn't love. I was getting, you know, doing the commute, showing up at the job. I worked on the 11th floor of a building that had no windows, if you can possibly even fathom that, right? So <laughs> literally, I would get to the building, I'd go up in the elevator, and then for the next nine hours, I would be in the middle of the fluorescent light bulb world, not a window to be found in the middle oh. of this building. And then I would go back down, and in the wintertime, because it gets dark earlier, I would go outside, and there was darkness again. It was like darkness to darkness and inside the rest of the time. And I remember, th I was very poor at that time, and I remember thinking to myself, I would go down to this deli and I would, uh, I would go down there and I would buy all the ingredients and then I would make my sandwich, right? And uh, so every week I'd get all the ingredients, I'd take it home, I'd make my sandwich, I'd bring it to work. And I remember going down to that deli and thinking to myself, 
I wish that I had enough money that I could buy a sandwich every day. Like that was going to be my high point at that, at that moment in my life. Right. And now a low for me is, wow, they'd like me to come back and speak at this event and I'm going to be really well paid for it, but it would mean I'd have to get on another flight. I'm already going to be on a flight that's cross continental that month. I just don't think I want to do that. And, and, you know, I hate to say no, it's a good event, but my low is that I have to say no to getting paid a lot of money to fly to a country that I couldn't even imagine someone was going to pay me to fly to, let alone pay me to speak at when I was so much younger. And this is what the ascending life curve looks like. Yeah. And that I think is my dream for every young kid, every adult is that they're transitioning in this way so that they're hot. They're, they're still have lows, but their lows are now so much higher than what used to be their highs. That, that's perfect. And I, I, I love how, how you explain that. It ties into uh, something that I'd like to get your feedback on. So we're we're obviously a little older. We both have children, and I have grandchildren. So I'm uh, the the grandpa, and I, we've we've been around the block for a while. But yeah, um, really, what I <laughs> when I was younger, when you were younger, there was media, whether it was good, bad, or uh, sci-fi. Star Trek is one media that I, I kind of like. Trekkie fan, I guess, and it gave, gave a vision and hope of the future. Interracial couples, uh, transporter, hologram room, uh, tricorder, um, all sorts of cool gadgets, and nobody smoked on the film, and everybody looked healthy, <laughs> and they did cool Never things. Never thought about that. That's I, so true. Yeah. I, ju I just, there was a lot of cool things. We've been able, because of that, to be creative, engineer, do movie magic, or somehow create something very similar to what that was like today. But our media that we have today doesn't really give us that vision of what the future will look like. We don't know what uh, a resilient, desirable future will look like. We know very well what a dystopian future will look like, one of doom and gloom, water world, right. and total recall, and fighting over resources, and one that's not very nice to live in. We know that very well, you know, zombie sure. apocalypse, whatever it is. But we don't have any, any visions, this vision or this hope at a young age to say, you know, here's that ascending curve, here's how it goes, here's how we can reach it. But also, let me give you some media, something visual, a story, a book, an example, so that you can envision what it will look and feel like to actually be in the future. And that's something that you as a creative, an architect, an engineer, a designer can create for. Whether at first it's movie magic and eventually we do the engineering to make it happen, make it real, maybe, you know, like Elon Musk or, you know, whoever the inventor or super guy is who's, who's, who's kind of creating some of that. But to even give us that feeling or vision of, uh, of something to work towards, to be hopeful and optimistic towards instead of, man, that's, we, we don't even know where we're going. And, and so th that's what I read out of your books, but also so what I'm hearing in your stories and experiences, do you have anything that kind of your thoughts or feelings in regards to that? Uh, what, what, is that true? Do you think we need more of that? Do you see hope? I totally see hope. Uh, I think that it, this goes back to the individual thing and, and probably this is part of the yin and yang of technology. So back in the time you're talking about when we were younger and there were only three channels on the entire television and you couldn't DVR it. And so you had to basically watch what was on or not watch it. Uh, there was a limit to the amount of selection we had about the inputs that we would receive. And so it was a great way to keep us entertained and often educational. I remember the Sundays, Sunday nights, the show about animals, uh, mutual of Omaha. I, I, I was Omaha. glued to the TV to see that. That was my only input that's visually could help me understand. This is what Africa looks like, et cetera. But we are so far beyond that now. And so now we're much more in the situation where we as individuals and as parents, this is part of our, our responsibility, but as individuals to identify what is that future that I want to experience. 
And then to find, this goes back to the discussion we're having earlier about finding those examples of people who have done it. And so if I want to go travel around the world, if I want to experience Africa to experience safari, then it's up to me to find someone who can help me paint that picture. And if I want to be uh, the next inventor of the great technology, then it's up to me to find those people who have walked that path, who can help me understand this is what it's like to be an entrepreneur. This is what it's like to get venture funding. This is what it's like to do the creative process for your invention and release it to the world. <clears throat> so it's much less to me about finding one example that fits everybody these days. And, and I love that because it gives us the chance to find the examples that are relevant to us. Now that said, I would love to see some categorization of the information to help people. And so if, you know, imagine a world in which you had a deep passion for sustainability. And so you could actually access the archive of 10 great stories of people who have marched the path of sustainability with incredible results. Um, you and I were talking uh, offline in our previous call about farming. I'm deeply enthusiastic and passionate that the answers to the world hunger and world consumption issues are actually in existence already. It's simply a matter of providing the resources. So for example, and this is what we were talking about previously when I was backpacking through uh, South Africa, very, very dry regions and yet they were growing peaches and pineapples and I couldn't understand how that was possible because peaches I had always seen grown in much more friendly climates. Um, and so if we could identify what the key factors are that enable someone to grow products, whether it's soil acidity, soil makeup, rainfall, the rest of that, and come up with this. So this is sort of my 10 examples. And so if I'm a farmer living somewhere where this is what I got to work with, I got this type of soil, I got this type of rainfall, but hey, holy cow, like, look at this. I can grow this here. I had no idea about that, right? And so sort of come up with these categories of database, not a thousand examples, but just 10 good examples, right? And here's 10 more good examples. If you want to be an entrepreneur, just fantastic stories. Something to kickstart the process of finding your who's so that I as an individual, whether I'm an adult or I'm a child, I'm not just looking at Google and like, whoa, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> so it's not that it's required criteria, but it's at least a starting point for someone who's interested. And I think you could probably come up with maybe 10 categories and 10 examples in each category. And man, oh man, that would be awesome to jumpstart the process. I've actually thought in that vein that you know, I think you could put, so I, I'm totally about helping a kid identify what are their big five for life and therefore really focusing it on. But I really think you could do a generic one that says, listen, if you're starting off, it's such a tough spot. And what you want to do is just be a millionaire. Like, you know, you want to, but you want to do it in a sustainable way. Like you don't want to crush people. You don't want to be hurting people, but you want to just get yourself out of the economic situation you're in to get some breathing room. I think you could probably come up with 10 degree programs that match up with the kid's interests and you could help them understand, here's how you budget, here's the scholarship programs that are available to you. And you could get this kid launched on a rocket ship to success so that they could start to have an income stream which was relevant to living a lifestyle. And then at that point, when they've sort of cleared the atmosphere and they've got some breathing room, then you could say, all right, so now let's start picking. What is it you really wanna do in that field? But this to me is the future, Mark. This is the great opportunity that we have to create these opportunities. Now, I will say, because I think this is a critical piece of it, I struggle with what to do with my own child in terms of when is the right time to start work. Because I did. I started working when I was 12 years old doing physical labor jobs. I don't necessarily recommend that, but one of the things I learned from that was to have a tremendous work ethic. And I don't think... It, I don't think it functions well, this system that I'm talking about, when you provide all the resources, but you don't help the kids understand, or the adults for that matter, that you got to work hard. You can't just have it handed to you because then nobody learns anything. All you learn is to be a constant recipient of free stuff. There's nothing gratifying in that to just constantly have everything handed to you. Um, I think it's, there's this great quote, I can't remember who said it, but one of the great opportunities in life is the chance to do work worth doing. And so to me, you can provide the vehicles, you can give all the infrastructure, but at the end of the day, it's critically important to help everybody who's involved in that to understand that you got to do your part. You got to work hard. 
And there's the reason you work hard is because the path is you enjoy what you're doing, you enjoy contributing, you enjoy learning. And, and that's maybe a piece of the puzzle that has been missing because previously like, yeah, you work hard at a job you hate. So what's the joy in that, you know? But I, I think if you sort of were able to combine all these pieces together, like that's it. That's the future that really is going to be discoveries. Like we have never seen discoveries before in the fields of medicine and the fields of um, sustainability and the fields of philanthropy. Um, discoveries in the field of how to protect our oceans in a way that we can have all the food that we want to have, and yet we're not destroying the tuna population to the point where they cannot procreate anymore. That's the future. Yep, I totally agree. There, uh, there's a, f- a few themes in what you're talking about. One, and you mentioned it earlier, is um, kind of this cell phone, the rising billions. There's been talk that we're going to have three billion people come online with smartphones in the palm of their hand, that they can ask this question, who is the best person at electric vehicles, at solar panels, at uh, farming? Who's the best person at uh, uh, doing blockchain or AI or whatever to to get that knowledge so that this collective intelligence, that we get it together and and we're not repeating the same mistakes, but also that we're learning differently. We're finding out those people who invented the wheel or invented certain things that we want to be a professional at as well, or that we find interesting to do. And, and then we do it. So I, I, I believe there's some, um, that's something that I would like to have as a, a, as a real time update of collective intelligence. I think that's something that, that makes yeah. us different than all the other wonderful species on, on our planet is we can pass on through videos like this, through books, through learning, um, this collective intelligence and, and to our children and to other generations and leave it behind so that they're not repeating the same mistakes. But also uh, it's this, this golden rule to leave the world better than we found it, to treat yeah. people and planet how we would like to be treated, this, this really true golden rule. And um, that's... I, I, that's why I love your books is because they give this, this new form of collective uh, intelligence or, or this wisdom, this great, even though they're short and concise and, and they're a great read and they Thank give you. people hope and aspiration and also things that can be applied to their lives to, to make that change. And so um, that kind of ties into this collective intelligence, but there's a gap. Not everybody knows about your books. Not everybody's heard about you and not everybody's heard about me. Um, and we talked about this offline before that there's also a point in time where each of us individually um, is ready to have an aha moment or to ask the question why. Yeah, That's one reason. But the other is that our systems and our civilization framework that we're currently in is not... Um, not one where that information and that equality of knowledge is always dispersed evenly around the world, depending on where we're born. And so, um, one, I'd like to know what your feelings are on that and how um, you're, you know, you're already pretty much been living in the future for a long time, but how are you going to, do you have any hopes or future aspirations to increase that more? Do you have any ideas or things you'd like to say on how we can kind of close that gap and bring us together as global citizens to get this information uh, out to people? So I think one of the big challenges I have is accepting the fact that not all people are nice. And, uh, I think in my heart of hearts, I really want to believe that all people are nice. And I suppose maybe at a soul level, maybe everybody is nice, but I've also realized, and I talk about this a bit, in a story that I wrote set in Africa called Life Safari, that maybe the way it works is that when we enter this experience, we have certain challenges. Like why, why do we exist as humans? So it's going to be a long answer to your short question. That's fine. Please. Uh, So why do we get our 28,900 days? Is there actually meaning behind our existence or is it just like, no, your parents had sex and nine months later you were born and you just live it out and then you die and that's it. So this questioning, this line of questioning you're asking leads us down a, a very interesting pathway, which is, is there more to life 
than just the 28,900 days? And the answer I've come to is there's one of two possible answers to this. Either there is, so you're something before you're born, then you're born, you go through this human experience for some reason, and then you die and you go back to being something else, um, a spirit, an energy, I don't know, uh, or there's not. But really, no matter which one is true, you might as well live an extraordinary life that is less fear built. Because if this is truly all there is, and there's nothing before, there's nothing after, then you might as well live your life in a very special way, which is to find the things that you love to do and that make you feel fulfilled. And that, and, and sometimes people get caught up in that question, They're like, well, yeah, but if that was the case, then everyone would just be purely hedonistic. But I really don't find this to be the case, Mark. I find that the vast majority of people, when you ask them, what do you want to do? Almost always it involves helping their fellow human being in some capacity. Why? Because it makes them feel good to make a contribution to the life of another. Um, so I think their def the definition of hedonism is a bit different compared to what people's perception is. That when people have the choice to live the life that they want to live, it's not that they go around shooting everybody else or doing destructive behavior, 100% the opposite that living the life they want to live is for the most part being a, a very unbelievably contributing member of the global community. Now, that said, there are these people who just, no, they're not, right? And I've struggled for a long time to understand that, but what I've come to realize is that I think actually my answer to how does this all work is that we are something before we're born, then we have this experience, so why? I think we're here to learn something. And the best way to learn something sometimes is by having someone be the counter projection of what we're trying to learn. And the analogy that I use is if you were given a soccer ball and a goal and you ran up and down the fields, it would be fun for a while and you'd be kicking goals for a while, but at some point it becomes boring. And so what do you do to make it more interesting? Well, you add teammates and then you work collaboratively and then you kick a bunch of goals, but at some point that gets pretty easy and boring too. And so what the system creates is the opportunity to have a defender. And when I kick a goal and I score because I was able to get beyond the defender, now I really feel like I have accomplished something. And so, and it's more fun. Uh, and so in life we have the defenders. And I think that historically certain people have played the role of the villain so that others can play the role of the hero. But I have a vision of the world in which we actually, as human beings, don't need to be the ones who play the role of the villain. That maybe there's enough other things out there that exist in our world structure that are the villain, that we could collaborate as humans to be the heroes. And medicine is a perfect example of that. What we're going through is a perfect example of that to me. That what if we could, what if we could all be teammates on this one <laughs> instead of requiring one of us to be the villain so that we learn something. The virus is the villain, we'll overcome that collectively as teammates. And if we start looking at the planet from that perspective, ooh, isn't that interesting? Mm. Isn't that a game changer? Uh, that there's enough challenges that exist already. We don't need to be the human challenges to be the villain and the hero. We can all be the hero and let the other stuff be the challenge. And I like that because I ask myself, what would the world look like if we were able to find the cure for cancer? You know, what would the world, and I don't think it's that far away, actually. I think with some creative thinking and looking at the world through a different lens, it's there. Um, so I get excited about that kind of thing. I, I get excited about that future. And I love this, this, you've shared with me your perspective about living in the future, and I so love that. And I think to me, this is what that future can look like, a world in which we are inspiring people to love learning, to work together. Maybe there will always be some humans who are the villains. I don't know. I, I hope not. I hope that we can rise beyond that. But if so, if that's the case, I learned something really powerful in the field of education by a guy. And he said, you do not, you do not inspire people to change their behavior by telling them that they're wrong said it never works. And this guy had been in education forever, working with kids, you know, as a principal, working with teachers. He said, you inspire people to change by building a better mousetrap. And so maybe that's the other big takeaway in this regard is that if we want the world to be a cleaner place where the sea turtles have better nesting zones, then I have to somehow inspire people to that, not just tell them that they're wrong. You, you do that in your books, but you do that in many different ways um, where you uh, 
give examples of the last, the Big Five for Life continued deal, GL, uh, a company that you mentioned in there that kind of yeah. shows a different way to do it and the results that come out of that and, and the, the feeling that you have. I really like that. I, I, um, I think it's so vital because uh, no matter how we choose to work or to uh, earn our wage or to live our life, um, the majority of us are currently uh, working uh, roughly 40 hours a week for someone else besides our family and our loved ones. And the statistics the, are showing that there's a, a higher job dissatisfaction yeah, and unhappiness yeah, than ever before. So what does that say? We're actually spending the majority of our time, our 28,900 days with people and doing something that we don't enjoy and don't like. Yeah. And what a miserable way to live. So, um, and, and here's the key piece of that to me. So we could, uh, we could, we could aggregate a committee, right. To solve this problem for everybody. And we could spend years studying stuff and the rest of this to try and find the solution for everybody. But this to me is one of those where this isn't about everybody. I mean, it's about everybody, but not about everybody, if that makes sense. So it's about everybody in terms of trying to create something, enable something which enables each individual person to get out of that rat race. But it is not about finding one solution that everybody has to go do because to me, at the end of the day, this is where the hard work comes in. This is where the personal choice comes in. This is where if you want to transition your life from where it is because it's not great to where you want it to be, I'm 100% on board for that. But if somebody says, I just want you to hand it to me on a silver platter, I don't think it works. I really don't. And so this is where if you are in the context of what you're talking about, if someone watching this is really good at what they do, whether it's IT or human resource management or accounting work or whatever. And they work in an organization that they feel is really the evil empire, whatever that means for them, right? Um, it's destroying the planet. It's dumping toxic chemicals somewhere. The onus is on me as an individual, if I'm working in that environment, to take my skills and my talents and my genius and apply that in a company that's actually doing great things. I can't wait for somebody else to fix it all. I have to be partly responsible for fixing what I can fix. And that means taking my genius and applying it in a way that has a po the kind of positive impact I want to see. Because this is the vision I have for the future that I really get psyched on in terms of the workforce. And you're seeing some of this take place now. And DLGL is a great example of that. Imagine if the best and the brightest, the most talented, most creative, hardest working people said, you know what? I am not interested in applying my contributions towards organizations that are doing things that are having a negative impact on the lives of others, having a negative impact on the planet. I instead insist as an individual that I apply my talents, skills, and genius towards something that has a higher power contribution, right? Better for the planet, clean drinking water, sustainable energy, whatever. If every one of the super talented people did that, who's left to work for the, the evil empire, whatever that is, right? The, basically, we each have the opportunity to make that transition, apply our skills, our genius towards a better reality. And if everybody who's super talented does that, we're going to get to the better reality. It's just going to happen by default. Who do the micromanagers have to manage if all the great people have left the company? The micromanager has no one left to manage. Yep. And so we each are not shackled to this, situation we can make our choice we have a choice and yeah we can make our choice we can um, take a step where we want to go and i know i'm not saying that that's necessarily 100 percent easy i get that and if you got obligations as a family member you're paying the mortgage you got the car payments the rest of that but you know what it's not that hard either because great companies and great leaders and great organizations are always looking to hire the best of the best the most talented the most driven the hardest working always yeah, I agree. It's, all, it's really, truly also a journey and discovery process for many people. They have to be right, ready. They have to get to the point to, to make that transition where they feel secure and stable enough to, to do that. And, and self-confidence and knowing yeah. who these companies are. 
Uh, but to me, this is where technology has come so far. Like we were talking about how in the world would you know who these amazing companies are 30 years ago, 50 years ago? Like that would require going to the library, talking to the library and trying to get a study of like, I don't know, you know, great companies. Nowadays, it's easy to find who the companies are. They're doing amazing things, both for the people that work at those companies and in terms of the output that they're um, contributing to the global community. It's super easy. So then it comes down to just personal choice. You know, am I, am I, now I know the places that I would like to go. Who are the who's? Who can I connect to that can help me get an intro at those companies? What am I going to contribute? Um, this to me is a great opportunity for young people. You're coming out of college, right? You got this skill set, you got the drive, you got the hustle, you're willing to work hard. Don't just take the first job that's offered to you. Like, be willing to be selective in choosing the job that you're going to apply your genius in a very positive and powerful way. Yeah, it's a, it's a big choice because if you choose wrong, you could be miserable. You could be working for someone and you find out really quick, what am I yeah. doing at the top floor of this building with no windows? Yeah. Buying, buying sandwich fixings to make my own sandwich, you know? And then you're like, this is insanity. It's crazy. And so. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know there was, I think, and this is maybe where a lot of people are. I didn't know there was a choice. Yeah. I was so clueless at that point in my life that I thought this is just the way it works. You, you, this is what you do. You go to the job that you hate. Uh, this is what everybody does. That's what I knew. Um, what I know now is that's totally not the case. And uh, that would be my, my dream for the future is uh, that these young people who choose to align themselves with companies and projects and endeavors that actually have them excited to wake up to it or work uh, you know, Monday through Friday, and they're probably not even going to work because as we talked about at the start of our call, you know, maybe they're completely working from home or they're working remotely or there's a combination of the two, but the lifestyle's wonderfully balanced with the contribution. Yeah. Yeah. It's so possible, Mark. I guess that's what gets me excited in this it call. Is, it is so right? Because it is so doable. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to move on to a couple other questions because we're yeah. getting close on time. Um, uh, we'll take the time as it goes. If you, if you bear with me, a sure. uh, few other things. Uh, do you have um, a favorite book uh, or inspiring author that you've read in the past that uh, you'd like to say, you know, this, that's one and, and kind of give us the reason why. Uh, so a couple of leap out of me. One is uh, I read, a, I was given a book called illusions uh, by an author named Richard Bach. And uh, I, I read it probably every year and I find something new in that story every year. Um, it's like magic. It's uh, it's amazing how you can read something and then your life situation changes and you read the same text a year later and you see something you didn't see before. It's a very small book. Yeah, um, but, my uh, it was a great inspiration for the first book that I wrote, the cafe on the edge of the world. Um, because I wanted, I wanted the reader of the cafe on the edge of the world to have a similar experience afterwards as what I get when I read versions. And uh, so I would, I would recommend that. And, and I've had the experience. I've given that book away to many, many people. Richard people Bach it. wrote it, by the way. Richard, Richard Bach, yeah. And Jonathan Livingston Siegel. So it's yeah. also my favorite. That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, and, and, and I've given it away to some people and they come back to me like, yeah, not my thing, which is fine. Right. But uh, for some people, it's going to be like a, a profound epiphany, a changer. Um, I struggle to read nonfiction because nonfiction to me just requires a lot more focus than fiction. Uh, but one of the books that was profound in my way of thinking about economics was uh, a book called How Rich, Nation, How Rich Nations Get Rich and Why Poor Nations Stay Poor. And I'll, I'll summarize it super quick, but I highly recommend reading it because the case stories and examples in there are really good. Um, but in essence, it is if, if all you are is a contributor of raw materials, then you are forever going to be a slave to whatever system you are part of. And an example of this in my world as an author is if all you do is create the raw material, which is the story, but you have no input into what happens after that, then you're always going to be required to write another story, to mine more raw materials, and you will always be at the bottom of the economic pyramid. And you really don't want to be at the bottom of the economic pyramid. And really, there has never been a better time for you to not be at the bottom of the economic pyramid because you can be an entrepreneur these days. You can have a YouTube channel. You can control your digital rights. 
So reading that book and asking yourself, how does that apply to my life and whatever my contribution is, is really useful. And so I would highly recommend that. Let me think if there's another one. Um, I love a book called Blue Ocean Strategies, which someone else also gave me, just in terms of if you're doing something entrepreneurial, and by entrepreneurial, like, you can even apply that to like you want to go work in another company, so you want to be a member of a company, but keep in mind that you're still an entrepreneur because you're choosing where to apply your genius. And so that book actually would be useful even for the, the person who wants to work for someone else about where am I choosing to work? Where am I choosing to add value? Um, but I love the book because it, uh, it just it challenges the reader to think about doing things differently. And I'm totally wired for asking myself, how do I do what nobody else has ever done before in a way that nobody else has ever thought to do it? Thank you. That's fabulous. That's uh, yeah. great. Well, uh, I'll also try to put in the link for that so that people can look, look for those books as well. And for pure entertainment value, cause I just talked about three books that will sort of progress you, but for pure entertainment value, because I totally believe that what you said before was right you don't maintain that ascending life curve by constantly pushing to contribute. Like you need to take downtime, you, you, whether that's riding in your kayak, which is something that I love to do, taking a walk on the beach, whatever is your thing. Like it's important to fill both, you know, put the oxygen mask on first to use the airplane example. You got to keep your tank full. I love Nelson DeMille. I think he is one of the most spectacular action thriller writers on the planet. I love his works. And so if someone is just looking for a decompress, pure entertainment, amazing writer. That's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you need that balance. You also need some, uh, uh, probably create some great visuals uh, as you're reading those and kind of a, um, not a detox, but a journey, a discovery of a new world, and, and, and which is really important. Um, we, we, we've read a lot of the same books or, or I think we, we like a lot of the similar books. Uh, um, I've done my homework on you and I've, I, I was, uh, that's why I said we've got so many similarities. What's, um, what's that? I, I don't want to interrupt your question, but I'm darn uh, curious to know, like what's on your short list of ones that you recommend? Well, uh, I'll tell you, there's a few. I mean, I, I, it's really hard for me to just pick one because I'm a reader. I read a couple books a week, and, and okay. um, I really, uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, first and foremost, and an activist, I want to stay up to date, but I also am inspired by the stories and the, and, and the things that come out uh, that, that keep me uh, abreast of things. There's a theme that we've talked about, and, and it ties to a book. It's called The Business Romantic is the book by Tim Liberecht. He's uh, from Hamburg, but he lived in the U.S. Now he lives in Berlin. And he wrote this book called The Business Romantic, and it you know, ties to you, you spend 40-plus hours working for someone else. And is that time where you find it? Uh, inspiring, romantic, wonderful, beautiful. Is it a, a, a true business romance? Not anything wrong or bad, but do you enjoy it? Is that mm -hmm. time well spent or are yeah. you miserable and not enjoying it? That's the time, your most valuable time you could be spending with your daughter, your wife, your, your family, who, whoever, the, your loved ones, and, uh, and not regretting it down the road in any way. Yeah. So how, how do you find that team that you can enjoy to work with and to be around and go to dinner with and talk with and celebrate with. And when you're sick or your family's sick, that you know you have a team to rely upon to, to be with and you're not just playing this all by yourself. So that's a good one by Tim Leverick. But some real ones that inspired me, obviously the, the, the very first one was by Richard Bach, Illusions and Jonathan Livingston Siegel. I'm a big uh, Napoleon Hill fan mm. believe it or not think and grow rich yes. I, I love self-help books as well but it's an amazing I, book to this day written in the 1930s yeah. or 40s right yeah bestseller uh, amazing and, and things and there's been some evolutions uh, uh, of the thoughts and uh, of applications today that are great but the top three i would say for me if i, I were to make a choice is um the hero's journey by joseph campbell uh, it's mm -hmm. applicable in any story, any movie, any 
life situation, any speech or presentation, this hero's journey that we all talk. It's basically that diffusion of innovation, the Gaussian curve, the bell curve that you, you spoke about, you know, this, this, the S curve, the, the curve of life that we all go through and how, how do we make that one a journey uh, that, that's going in the direction we want. Um, yeah. uh, and he came up with a saying, uh, follow your bliss. Right. And I've lived for that forever. I used to do a Joseph Campbell, Campbell like a circle uh, and have meetings and talk about uh, mythology and different things because there's a lot of mythology. These stories are narratives of life of humankind. And so he's a big one I'm a big fan of and uh, all his books, but that hero's journey is a real good one. Um, the other one is uh, Paul Hawkins book drawdown. So, and he just came out with the re review drawdown review uh, just recently, but uh, it's, how can we draw down global warming? So it's an mm -hmm. action plan a book of actual physical things and actions we can take to draw down global warming. And um, that's just a, a fabulous book. You know, it's not a bunch of talk. It's not about we're hoping for charity or politics or something. This yeah. is what we can do today to yeah. draw it down. And uh, it's a fabulous, and it's, he's the editor of the book, but there's like 200 scientists and researchers that contributed to this factual. That's uh, an absolute uh, fabulous book. Um, awesome. So I was not familiar with the two of those. So that's, uh, that's yeah. <laughs> love that. I'll be adding those to my reading list. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely wonderful books. And, and I, I really, um, also, like, I mean, there's so many. It's hard for me to, I can't, I, Gunter Pauli's book, The Blue Economy, is very similar to Drawdown, which I like as well. But I'm a, a bookworm. I just absolutely love books in all, all facets. And I truly do love yours. And I, I think, you know, they're, you. they're on that shelf as far as inspiring. And, and uh, that I've given away many of them will continue to do so because I believe that, um, if people are in the right place and uh, ready to take that journey of discovery, there's not only a way to apply what you talk about into self-help, but to apply that into complete life-changing things that have aspects for your own person, but for your business, your, your organization as an entrepreneur, and my passion, sustainability and the environment, because I believe those are uh, tied together. Uh, they're linked together. They're not separate things. So yeah. uh, what I do is tied to my life as a homo symbiose. And so uh, when I read it, I read it with a different glasses or different lens. I read it in the form of how can I apply that into principles of sustainability, how I live my life as a good steward, because and this is what we've, we've touched upon. And we're not passengers on this spaceship Earth. And that's what you've said in multiple ways during our, our discussion, that we're a team member. We're part of an yeah. integral part of this big, big system. And we also need to take the gears and, and drive and make sure we're a good steward. And uh, nobody's here just for the ride, and we're going to drop them off on spaceship Mars or spaceship Jupiter or wherever. Uh, they're par they're part of what happens on our planet, whether they're good or bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I, I think a piece of that that is uh, one of the big takeaways in my life. Uh, I didn't think that when I was younger, and, and I, I suppose this is a comment that I'll make, especially relevant to younger people but it can certainly apply to anyone, but I didn't think I was very important. I didn't think my contribution was relevant. I didn't think that I had much to add. And my message to everyone who's, who's listening to this or watching to this is that's so wrong that everybody, as you just said, has something to add. Everybody has something to contribute. And it's about finding your, your niche, finding the place where you're going to make that contribution. And uh, so everything we've talked about sort of in circles around that, I just want to hit that one key point is if you're out there and you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, easy for, for you to say, you know, 
you got a book on the bestseller list and, you know, well, it was only when I finally realized that I had to, I had to start believing in myself that maybe there was something that I had to contribute and to acknowledge that fact that I was able to get to where I've got to. And uh, so I want someone who's out there questioning their own self-worth to realize, no, you, you've absolutely got something to contribute. Absolutely. You sure do. in in, in many, many ways. And so do, so does uh, many other people. And I think they'll, find their big five for life and inspiration through things you talk about. I wanted to circle back to Africa one last time because you have a lot of examples for, for Africa and inspiration. Um, I have several projects going on there as well, um, all over. Um, and uh, it's dear to me as well. Uh, just did the, the beginning of this year a tour with the, uh, the princess uh, uh, Absa Dijma from Burkina Faso and uh, uh, was at the World Economic Forum and did a tour before and done projects with her and many other things. Um, why is Africa an inspiration to you and also Oprah and maybe is it a tie that's something you've also touched upon with um, uh, Nobel laureate there as well, or this educating the youth or people about the big five for life. Does that have anything to do with Africa? The, so the concept of the big five for life is based on an experience I had in Africa. And so when you're in Africa and you're on safari to see the animals, everyone talks about the, these five specific animals and people gauge the success of their safari experience based on how many of these five they see. And that was the major aha epiphany I had when I came back from my travels around the world and where this concept came from that. So if I see three of the African big five, I would rate my safari as a C. If I see four, it's maybe a B. And if I see all five of the African big five, it's an A plus Nirvana, exactly what I came to Africa for type experience. And that was my, my wonderful epiphany that, well, what if we were identify our own big five for life? So it's not about the African big five animals, but our own big five for life. And, uh, and then we could evaluate our own existence. Is it going to be a C, a B, or an A++? And so that's where it comes from. And I suppose, I suppose there's an element of that's why I love Africa is because I had such a major epiphany that has transformed my life and I've, you know, I've had the great experience of seeing it transform the lives of other people kids, adults, even people as old as in their late 70s, early 80s who've gone through the experience of even at that stage of life, figuring out what are their big five for life and how do they want to adjust the minutes of their day to be in alignment with that. And so I, I'm sure for the rest of eternity, I will hold that sweet spot in my heart for Africa and what that experience brought to me. Um, I don't, I don't know why else it's there. I just, yeah, it, it is a, it's a magical experience to spend time in Africa. And uh, to, to see the animals and experience the people and to see, I mean, the, the, the natural offerings of Africa are truly spectacular also. You know, I mean, just the, the coastlines and everything about it is, is special. So if, Great. if I, always, I always say to a live audience, you know, if, if any of you here has the calling to go, find a way to make it happen because you, you won't be disappointed. I've never met a person who said, I went and didn't use the expression. It changed my life. Like almost everybody says that exact words. It changed my life in some capacity. So, yeah. Do you have a feeling that um, Africa, the future of Africa is going to be a lot different than we, we see it from the UN or the current position today? As you know, I think the challenge that we as humanity face is that many of the people who would be the best leaders do not get the chance to be the leaders because they don't have the power hungry drive to crush everybody underneath them. The best example of leadership ever in Africa, in my opinion, is Nelson Mandela and Mandela suffered for decades in prison to arrive at a place where he had this unbelievable state of empathy for all people. I mean, it was almost like saint-like in the way that he was able to look at people who had oppressed him and oppressed some of the things he believed and to arrive at a place where he was able to see everyone's role in the story for what it was and say, we can work collectively towards this in a better and more positive way. 
how many Mandela's, how many Mother Teresa's, how many Gandhi's do you get in a lifetime? I don't know. I just don't know. And, and the infrastructure needs to exist where that type of person is allowed to, to foster and grow and develop. And do we as a world society create those opportunities for that type of personality at a governmental level? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. So it can happen in extreme circumstances, which is what happened in South Africa coming out of apartheid. But I don't know if it exists otherwise, Mark. I really wish I could say with certainty that it did, but it just seems like to get to the top, it's about the bloodthirsty cry. I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, but I, but I still go back to I'm always a person of hope. I, I firmly believe that, again, maybe it's maybe – so maybe it's this. Uh, maybe if the best and the brightest and the most talented can apply their skill sets in a direction and with – leaders that they firmly believe in, then maybe that potentially can become the new norm. Um, I don't know. One of my personal heroes from Africa is Wangari Matai, who was the leader of the Green Belt Movement. And uh, I was asked to write a foreword for a book that's a biography about her life. And so I was rereading her story. I don't know. It's just kind of depressing. It's like you, you, have, you have someone in charge who is just crushing the population, doing all the things wrong. And you have this surge of 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 the society that says we want it to be different but then when it comes down to picking a candidate who they collectively agree will be the one to make a difference at that point it's like the five top people end up all about themselves it becomes again that ego kicks in and then nobody can agree and then it doesn't work so i don't know wow it requires such a massive collective letting go of egos and belief in the common good I don't know, man. It's like what we were talking about. So what has done that recently? This virus has done this recently. Like yeah. finally we stopped fighting each other and we work towards a collective community good. It's sad that it requires something like that, but that's sort of the vision, I guess, is can we get beyond that without requiring the major obstacle? I hope so. <laughs> I really do, but I don't know. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's. Uh, I'll tell you what, Mark. I, I'm willing to lend part of my minutes on the planet towards that. And I think a lot of other people are too. So, so that gives me hope. I, I see you as a, a one global citizen in many ways. You have the power to influence people's uh, ability to find Big Five for Life without even knowing it, just by having a book out there that can inspire people and that you that you have some visions there and I see um, not only Africa but I see the entire world um, coming together in a much different way um, in the future I have a very I've been living in the future for a long time and so that's why I'm pretty prepared for where we're at today and and can give people inspiration hope um, because some of the things I do with the SDGs and and other uh, things are are based on models through back casting of what does that future look like and what yeah. will it look and feel like when we reach it. And um, so I have a lot of hope and optimism that w we can do it. We will do it. We should do it. And, and what it will look and feel like when we get there, regardless of the pandemic and, and the situation we're in um, right now, um, some of it's not really personal, but we're feeling this, civilization framework discomfort right now on a global level, uh, the pandemic, but also that our current civilization frameworks are not working for us anymore, that economies are not working for us anymore and governments, uh, whether it's the Putins, the Bolsonaros or the Trumps or whoever, it's not working for us in, uh, anymore uh, on a global level. But we have to keep that economy afloat or those old system uh, afloat long enough till we can transition to something else. And this has given us a wonderful time to take a pause, to do yeah. a reset, to use this time to uh, rally around our loved ones, to think about what we need to do to do that reset, to, to not go back to business as usual or the life before the pandemic, but the one 
that's this much more resilient, desirable future. And I believe that you provide these tools uh, in your books and in our conversation of hope and inspiration of what people can do on an individual basis to make that transition. It's not hard. It's not painful. It is work. And yeah. we can do it. And there will be good or bad days. Um, but uh, if we stick to it, we can definitely do it. Um, this is where I'll kind of end, but I want, I want you to try to put the positive spin on it at the end here is, well, yeah. as big historians, we have seen that uh, civilization frameworks in the past um, no longer exist today. Not only the way we started out this conversation, the hominids, uh, uh, eight of them aren't here anymore, but Homo sapien is. Well, we have some not too distant civilizations, Mesopotamia, Aztecs, Mayas, Incas, Roman Empire, Greek Empire, you know, 12 plus huge civilizations that were advanced and had yeah. infrastructures. They're not here anymore. All that right. is left is ruins. And we go to those ruins and we take selfies and and that's not really what I do when I go on vacation. I don't think you do it either. Um, but, but as a big historian, we say, what, what are we seeing here with these ruins? What are we learning about in school when we learn about history and civilizations? Yeah. They're not here anymore. Well, why aren't they here anymore? All but two are not here anymore because an environmental um, – ecological collapse and, and right. two of them aren't here because of uh, some kind of a conflict or other kind of uh, uh, issue for a collapse. So right now uh, we've got a pandemic. Could it be a collapse? Could it be at a civilization framework? I don't know, but I believe we have the tools and just because we have technology isn't going to save us from a collapse. But I believe that we really have the wherewithal to come together as global citizens and to move forward to this much greater resilient desirable future so that in the future we don't have to worry about our resources we don't have to worry if we have enough toilet paper we don't have to worry if we have enough food that we have a, a framework that works for everyone and that's yeah. why i asked you the question what does a world that works for everyone look like for you because that's really, we need something that works for everyone. As long as there's poverty, inequality, bad education, and this collective consciousness is not, not out there. If people don't know about your books or previous mistakes, that's not a desirable future. And so I leave it to you to kind of leave your final words and remarks on, on how you feel about that and how our positioning is moving forward and, and what your suggestions are maybe as well. Sure. Yeah. So uh, a number of things come to mind and so I'll, I'll try and be brief. You don't have to be think, brief. You got time. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I think giving everybody a shot, right? I think everybody deserves a shot. And by that, what I mean is, yeah, it, it would be awesome if the things we talked about were able to be implemented and successfully implemented so that a kid is, is worked with so that they can figure out their big five for life. Examples, role models, collectively, they plus someone who's a mentor type person helps them figure these things out. That's their shot. Now it's up to them. So to create an environment where people are given a shot. So that's what applies to kids. And I think you'd apply it to adults as well. If the person decides not to take the shot, that's their call. You know, I mean, I, I don't think anyone would want to be forced to do something in life. And so if, if you give someone an opportunity and they say, I'm not interested, I totally respect that. that. That's maybe not their path. It's maybe not the right time. It's maybe not the right circumstances, but I do think everybody deserves to get a shot. And so if we can create a, a situation where people are given their shot, uh, that would be awesome. Then it's up to the individual to do the steps, to do the hard work, to make it come a reality. I think, and I love these types of conversations because just when I'm, I'm thinking, I don't see the answer. Like I'll hear you say something. I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Like what, we can do that. And so when I was giving you my answer, uh, in terms of Africa and what I see for the future of Africa, and just to be, to, to be clear, I think the, the context in which I was setting about leadership, et cetera, is really a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just Africa by any stretch. 
Um, but I, I, then I was hearing you talk about something and I said, and I thought to myself, well, that actually is the answer. The, the answer is if, if I, as a global citizen, see a place where things are being done really well and that's where I go on vacation and that's where I spend my tourism dollars. Well, then in essence, I'm supporting the thing that I think is being done really well. If I choose to go to, um, no matter the way in which I contribute my minutes, my resources of time, my resources of financial, how I allocate all of that is going to determine what the future of the planet looks like. Yeah, so I guess the big happy takeaway from our conversation as it relates to that topic is that it is always our individual choices, how we allocate our time, our financial resources, all the other resources that we have at our disposal that determines the future of the planet, of our lives. And so if I spend my tourism dollars at a place that is tremendously sustainable in terms of Africa and the, the people are treated well within the country and the animals are respected, the environment is respected. If I choose to allocate my money there, then I'm making that difference. And if, if the majority of people spend their money there, then that place grows in terms of its ability to make positive contributions and to do things well. So that is probably the big happy side of that discussion is that our individual contributions, no matter how small they may seem, are actually critically important in terms of determining what the world looks like. And that's empowering and that's inspiring. And I love that aspect. So thank you, Mark, for, for bringing that to light in our conversation. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for your time. And, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to have this discussion with you. I feel like I'm sitting right next to you, even though we're thousands of miles apart. And <laughs> we'll do that in the future. Yeah, we'll have to definitely do it. And I'm glad that you, that you and your family are well and that uh, we've had this time. I'm going to be posting this. Uh, uh, this is a, a piece by, as editor f uh, at large for Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media, who does a lot for the United Nations and the European Union and the World Economic Forum. So that there are other entrepreneurs and environmental activists and, and activists and, and people can see and hear about your uh, wonderful ideas and our discussion. I hope there will be some wonderful takeaways and that they'll take awesome. the time to, to dive into this. Is there anything that you would, would like me, a message specifically for them that would be important to, that you want to give them that maybe you haven't got out in this time? Uh, just, you know, if I, I would say to people, I can't guarantee that I'm available because I have lots of projects running on my own. But if someone has something that is a passion project and they say, wow, it's, I, I think I think John could be a who on this for me, uh, to use the vernacular we've been talking about in our earlier discussion. You know, don't hesitate to reach out. If I, if I can't do it, I will be uh, I will be very honest and let you know that I just don't have the bandwidth at the moment. But if I can be of assistance, I, I like you said, I want to leave this planet. And on the day that I die, I want to be able to look back and say, I left it just a little bit, hopefully just a little bit better than when I got here. I made my contribution. I made a difference. And so when people are passionate about something, about making a difference, if I can be of assistance, don't hesitate to reach out. And if I can help, I will. Thank you so much, Sean. We'll, we'll put those links of the books and your website on as well. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for what you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you.